We're going to walk through the story in detail. Um, I'll tell you about, you know, my journey at HubSpot. I joined as the fourth employee. I was the first salesperson. I spent 10 years there. And when I left, my team of sales and customer service people was 500 people across the world. And so really saw this exciting scale and was blessed with this opportunity. And I'm excited to share it with all of you. What people really get a kick out of the story is this was my first sales job. I had never worked in sales before. I'm trained as an engineer. I started my career as a computer programmer, and I studied at MIT, which is a very quantitative program, obviously. And so my career foundation was rooted in data and science and process. And that's the way I make all of my decisions. So I did not go into the HubSpot role thinking, oh, I should write a book about this later or speak about this later. I was just really scared. I had to put food on the table for my family. And when I get nervous and scared, I turn to the data. It's just my roots. And so since leaving HubSpot, it's been exciting as a faculty member at Harvard Business School to see the applica application of this data-oriented approach, how it can be applied to many other companies and also many roles beyond sales. So I'll tell you a little bit about my experience with that as well. So this is gonna be our journey to go through hiring, training, developing, even promoting and exiting people in a data-driven way. And so I'll tell you how I did at HubSpot and tell you how I've seen it done at other companies. We'll start with the hiring front. What do you look for in a sales hire? Very interesting and dangerous question to ask at a conference like this, and I'll tell you why. My first year, I hired one salesperson every month. We were hiring at a pretty rapid rate. And I think it was the eighth sales hire I made. I had been courting this one salesperson for months, trying to convince them to come to HubSpot. And finally, they accepted and decided to come. They were the number one salesperson from a large public company back in Boston. Number one out of 800 salespeople. We were only 20 people at the whole company. And I was just, I treated this person like a god. Come, teach us to sell. This is going to be amazing. And months later, they were not our top seller. They weren't terrible, but they certainly weren't, they were not one of our best. And it really made me scratch my head. How could that be? The number one seller from 800 an 800-person team, and they're only average at our small little company. And then I thought about it, and I thought about what it was like to sell at that big company that was literally running television ads on big sporting events. Everybody knew the company. Everybody knew the problem they solved. And then what it was like to sell at HubSpot way in the beginning when no one knew who we were, and no one knew what inbound marketing was, you can imagine that the type of salesperson that would succeed in this environment is way different than the type of person that would succeed here. And that's why it's dangerous to come to a show like this and to talk to your neighbor and say, what do you look for in a salesperson? Because as it turns out, their optimal answer is probably different than what yours is because of that change in context. So I discovered that this ideal sales hiring formula is different for every company, but there is a process that's the same for everybody to engineer their own. And that's a bit what Marcel was inspired about and talked about in his, in his generous uh, introduction. So I just sat back and, and thought about, you know, what, what would be the 10 criteria given our context 
that would correlate with success. I think most good hire, hiring managers and HR people do this, but you know, really document, what do I mean by intelligence? What do I mean by passion? And what would a score of a three versus a five versus a 10 sound like to try to make an attempt to normalize all of our hiring managers assessment of candidates. And so it was interesting, even when company, I see companies hire three people in a year to be able to have this paper trail and to be able to kind of think about six months later, especially in sales, were they good or not and did we assess them appropriately? So if Bob is struggling and he's not doing well, why is that? And did we appropriately assess that criteria in the interview? And Mary is doing amazing. Why is that? And are we appropriately assessing it? So it sounds so intuitive, it's so simple, but rarely do I see companies have the discipline to have this learn, test, iterate motion to hone in on your ideal hiring formula. And it's critical when you hire five people, but it's even more critical when you go into a year hiring 50 salespeople, like we got to. It was comforting to have this rigor behind us. It wasn't long where I could actually do a regression analysis. I got one of my buddies at MIT to organize this data. They, they, they have weird passions, these MIT people. And he was salivating over this data. And he analyzed what of these attributions were correlating with success. So the ones down here had a negative correlation, which means these things cause people to not be successful. And the ones up at the top were positively correlated. That's what made people successful. Now what was interesting about this analysis was at the time, which is about 2009 when I first published it, we'd been talking about how customers were demanding a different type of salesperson. They were sick of being ripped off. They were sick of being lied to. And the internet empowered them to no longer need salespeople. And this analysis statistically showed me that. When, I, when we think about what is a typical like car salesperson, right? We think about closing ability, convincing, objection handling. That was negatively correlated with success. And when we think about a great trusted advisor, a great coach, a great consultant, preparation, domain experience, intelligence, that was what mattered for our environment. So this really set a vision for me of the type of modern sales team that I wanted to build. And so ultimately I'll tell you at the time of when we took the company public on the New York Stock Exchange, there were five attributes that really stood at the top for us in terms of what we assessed our salespeople on. All three of these were among those five. But which one do you think was number one? Let's take a survey. How many people think intelligence was the number one correlator and predictor of success in our environment? How many people think coachability was number one? How many people think it was curiosity? Okay, I got you. And most audiences think it's curiosity, but it was coachability. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't even include coachability in my first theory of what would correlate with success in our environment. It took me about two years to figure it out. So these were the five that mattered most in our environment. Coachability, curiosity, intelligence, work ethic, prior success. Now, what, what happened with the coachability was I would be hiring these people who had great sales abilities, and then they wouldn't work out. And I realized the pattern behind that was they were folks who had 
a lot of experience in sales, and they were somewhat resistant to the training and coaching we were giving them. And we were at the brink of a new type of sales process where we called leads that are marketing generated and closed those leads over the phone. And so we were, everyone kind of had to learn this new process, and I think that's why coachability rose to the top. These folks were just kind of like, Mark, thanks for the training, but no thanks. I know how to sell. And ultimately, a lot of them failed. So as a result, I really started to evolve my hiring process around assessing coachability. And let me show you what my interview was when I was doing all the interviewing. So what I would do is I'd start off, the interview for me started in the lobby when I met the candidate. And it wasn't a, a showstopper, but it was a lost opportunity if they didn't like kind of recognize me and maybe read a little bit about my background, maybe that I coached football last weekend, you know, just be a little, have done some research and kind of open the door. I like that. It shows that they're personable and they can make a connection. If they didn't do it, the interview's not over, but it's a lost opportunity. Then I just warm them up with an easy question, you know, why are you interested in HubSpot? Where would you like to be in a couple years in your career? Then I'll take a look at their, their, uh, their uh, past record of success. So I noticed that you're an account executive at this tech firm. How many other account executives were there? Oh, 150? Where did you rank? 10? That's impressive. Is that based on last year's revenue or last quarter? And were your recommendations, were your, your uh, referrals, will they validate that? Okay, then I will go into, what do you think it is about your approach that made you number 10? And why weren't you number one? Now, most salespeople blame their territory. And so a little trick is you can ask which territory is the number one rep, and then you can go and recruit them. But uh, that's just a little trick that I've used over the years. Okay, then we really get in to the coachability. So we'll do a role play with the candidate. So I'll tell them, okay, you be a salesperson at HubSpot. I will be a prospect. And I'm going to be a VP of marketing at a security company. And let's say I came to the HubSpot website um, last night and I downloaded one of your ebooks on inbound marketing and you were assigned the lead. Take your time, tell me when you're ready to start. You're gonna call me. And so they go. And I watch how they do and I watch do they, do they what we call show up and throw up on me with all the information I could have just read on the website or do they ask me good questions about my pains and my goals and my needs, right? Then I, about 10 minutes in, I challenge them with a technical question around search engine optimization, which is part of our offering, just to see if they've done some homework and how well they've learned. And then my favorite part is as we move along, I'll stop the role play and say, okay, great. How do you think you did? I want to see if they can self-assess. And if they say, I was awesome, I'm not that psyched about that. But if they say, you know, I think I did pretty good here, but I wish I could have done better here. And I'll coach them. And this is really important. So it's a minor detail, but when I move into coaching them, I tell them in all my interviews, I give candidates one positive feedback, in one area of improvement. And the reason why I'm disciplined around saying that is I found that if I just start talking to them about what they did wrong, they get really anxious and nervous and think they're bombing, they're doing badly in the interview. And I wanna see the real them. So by doing that, you know, one positive, one need for improvement, it helps me see that Mark does this all the time. And so I coach him and I watch how they learn and then I have them redo the role play. 
Now, everybody messes that up. Don't have high expectations if you try this. It's the effort that counts. But I will tell you, when I spent 15 minutes in an interview with a candidate and actually improved them, I hired most of those people. Because I couldn't wait to spend a day, a week, a month coaching them if I was able to make progress in just 15 minutes. And so as the company grew, we had to use a bigger process. I wasn't the only person interviewing, obviously. And all this formula, the sales hiring formula, was a great roadmap to teach my future hiring managers. So when we were hiring, say, 50 salespeople in a year, I had to rely on other sources. So we started with a, a phone screen with a recruiter, someone who didn't work in the sales department, but did work full time at HubSpot. And I didn't want to rely on them for any type of sales skill assessing. Just really basic stuff like how much do you make? You're an account executive, exactly what, you do, what do you do in your role? And let me explain to you what we pay and what our role is. And let me explain to you that with all of our candidates, we have them take an assessment, a written assessment, early on in their process. And that's our next step, is I'm going to send you an assessment. So Kenobi didn't exist back then, but we used different assessments that back in the United States, and that was a good experience for us. So they took the assessment. We never made a hire, no hire decision off the assessment. But instead, it gave us guidance as to where the weaknesses were that we can spend the time in our interview on. And then we did a phone screen with the hiring manager who that candidate would join. And that's where we started to assess the sales skills. Now, one interesting change we made over time as we learned is we did the role play on this phone screen before we met the candidate. And that turned out to be really important because this job was 100% on the phone. Our customers never met the seller. And we found that if we did the role play in person or did it after we met the candidate, we were somehow biased about the rapport building of the phone call because we knew the candidate. And that wouldn't be a context that our customers had. So that was an important change for us on how we actually did the role play. Then we had the folks come in, and they met, we met them largely for cultural fit, and also I would meet them. Now, the other thing we did was we gave them our sales playbook after the phone screen, if they passed it. We gave them our whole sales playbook as if they were hired. And I often find that companies don't take advantage of that. They, you know, they'll say, you know, Bob's not working out. Bob's not working out. And I'll say, well, when did you know? And like, literally the second day. I'm like, what were you doing in your interview process? Was this largely just based on the resume? And so there's opportunities when you think about when you make these hires, what are they going to do with your company in the first week or two weeks or three weeks? And can you do some of that during the interview process? And would that be a better indicator of how they're going to perform at your company? So we gave them the playbook right from the beginning, and then we expected them to adjust their role play, and we could again test that coachability. And so if I liked the candidate by the time they got to me, I always soft close them. I always said, if we give you an offer, are you coming? And it made a lot of candidates gulp, but I wanted to get that verbal commitment and know where we stood. And so we went, moved on to references like a lot of you do. I think two aspects to the references and what I see in the industry as a bit of a mistake is obviously the references the candidate gives us are always going to say great things. My favorite question to ask is to force the reference to stack rank a set of attributes. So I might say, you know, we're really interested in hiring Mary. Could you rank her intelligence or her coachability or her work ethic? Can you take those three items and rank them from her strongest to her weakest? And that gave me, even for a person that's going to say a lot of good things, 
it gave me an indication of what Mary was like, and it helped disprove or validate some of the concerns that I had. And then I don't know the laws in Brazil around what I call backdoor references, but we used a lot of backdoor references, and what that means is we certainly called the references the candidate gave us, but we always looked for people that they didn't give us. And that, I'll tell you, my CEO puts most of the weight of his assessment on those calls. And so again, check your local laws from an HR standpoint, but those were really valuable for us to work hard and go get. And then finally, just to close, we did a lot of effort in nurturing candidates. We work hard on this hiring, and it's a shame if you're only getting 50% of the people you make an offer to. That's a shame. And there's usually a really good opportunity for some low-hanging fruit to get that up to 80 or 90% through the use of the soft close and by using your most valuable resources and nurturing people from the time they accept through giving notice to the time that they join. Okay? So hopefully that gives you a glimpse of um, our process and helps inspire some ideas. I talked about the training. The other piece I'll say is we've got this game back in the States called basketball. I think you guys play it down here. You shoot it in the hoop. We got this really famous coach called Red Arback, and he says, you can't teach height. And really the takeaway for us there is there are certain weaknesses that are more fixable than others. And as you're setting up the weight of your assessment, you may want to hone in on that as a guidance to what matters. Okay? All right. So we've got this baseball team that we love back in Boston called the Boston Red Sox. I know some Brazilians have made the major leagues back home, so I know you have the sport down here. And they apply these concepts to their team. They hire 1,500 employees to sell tickets. And they found that most of their hiring, they had a ton of turnover, and most of their hiring was just by looking at the resume. Really bad. So they did what we talked about. They analyzed the patterns, and they found that for their ticket sellers, high energy, character, likability, and hunger were the most important thing. And the innovation I love is they started using video applications as a way to streamline the process. And through this process, they had significant improvements, faster hiring, and a pretty uh, dramatic drop in turnover. Similarly, this is a more sophisticated example from a jeweler who had 20 locations across the United States, 120 salespeople, and they just wanted to drive th these metrics for them were sales per hour and total units sold. And so they did a study, which is actually pretty sophisticated here, and found that things like dominance and the quickness to create a connection was what actually mattered for them. And so this is a you won't walk away understanding this, but this just um, showed this, this self-factor A is a pretty sophisticated analysis of what this person was in terms of dominance and quickness to connect and people who weren't. And you can see a nice correlation to their performance and how that differed by geography. And so they rolled that out and had significant upgrades in terms of the, the sales per hour um, as well as the conversion rate on particular folks. So this stuff is happening even outside of software uh, to help drive your hiring models. Okay? So just a couple points here is, you know, I did, a, I did a, some work for um, a home alarm system company this past year, and they were losing all of their talent to the hot tech companies. And so what we did was we realized they were going after the wrong candidates. They were going after the candidates that are already qualified for the tech sales. And what they needed to do was go after, they didn't need that level of a salesperson. They had to go after a more junior person that was years away for qualifying for their tech sales. And when they started to think about themselves as a, as a step in a salesperson's journey, as opposed to trying to retain everybody, Lots of light bulbs went off. Lots of really great ideas went off. So just think about where you sit in a candidate's progression. Sometimes leaving, losing these folks is a good thing for them and a good thing for you in terms of de developing skills. Okay? Um, and then the other thing we talked about sourcing. In my experience, the best salespeople out there never have to do an interview. 
every quarter their ex-bosses are calling them. Hey, I just moved to this great company. You ever need a job, you know you can come to me. And so I have a lot of issues if the sourcing strategy is just in finding active candidates, like a job post, as opposed to a strategy that goes after those passive candidates. And a couple of tricks that I've used here is the forced referral and proactive LinkedIn sourcing. And so what that means is we, of course, implemented a referral bonus, but it didn't really work. When it really kicked in is when I had a new person start at the company, I waited three or four months for them to settle into our culture, and I said, you know what? Let's sit down for half an hour tomorrow, and tonight I'm gonna go through your LinkedIn and find about 10 or 20 candidates that you're connected to that would be a good fit for us. And I'd like to hear from you how well you know them, if you think they would be a good fit, and whether you know them well enough to introduce us. So I don't know what it is, if people are lazy or they're just slow to think, but when we introduced the referral bonus, we didn't get a lot of referrals. But when I proactively sat down with people and went through their connections, we got some really good candidates from that. The other thing is if I didn't have, when I did have to reach out to someone, I had this sneaky little email that I used where the subject line was where they work and where they went to school. Think about that. If you got a cold email from someone and it was where you currently work slash where you went to school, you're probably going to open that email. And then I just said to him, you know, congrats on all your success. You know, we, we're building the sales team here at HubSpot. We have too many leads and we need to hire more people, which salespeople love to hear about. And then at the end, do you have any of your friends that are like you that are in the market? And that way they didn't feel like they were cheating on their employer when they got back to me or when I called them the next day and they took my call. And most of the time, like, you know, I'd be interested in hearing about this. So just a little, that's one particular template, but just being really thoughtful about the subject and the cadence of those outreach emails that can be effective. And so here's some of the ways that you can apply this. I mean, this isn't just about sales. I mean, today we're, we're hiring, we're looking at marketing, how they re contribute revenue to sales. We're looking at product engineers and the usage. We have agile teams that work on particular features and we can measure how often they're used. We have customer support that after they have a support call, the caller is asked to give a net promoter score. And same with customer success in terms of the retention. So it's not like sales is the only measurable function anymore. And a lot of these hiring attributes at HubSpot we applied to these functions, and I've seen other companies apply them to the, these functions as well. This is a broad HR opportunity. So in summary, step one is you want to quantify exactly what they want to do and create that scorecard. What are you looking for? And how are you going to assess those folks? And then most importantly, give yourself an opportunity to learn, iterate on that and get it right over time. It's really important to start doing early on so as you scale, um, you have that formula. So let's talk about onboarding. Who is the salesperson in this photo? Is it the good-looking, money-hungry man or the helpful young lady? Is it the sleazy cigar smoker, or is it the thoughtful, intelligent academic? Is it the devil or the doctor? It's an interesting thought, but what's even more funny is if you do a search in Google for salesperson, all of the photos on the left show up, and none of the photos on the right. How? did this happen? How did we create this function that goes out and represents us amongst our potential customers, talks about our offering, and they're known as greedy, sleazy, cigar-smoking devils, and not as helpful, thoughtful, you know, people that are looking to, to help us out and solve our problems. And I think what we've learned so far from some of the analysis is 
is this change now because of the empowerment of buyers? And that prior analysis said that it does. And here's what happens is most people, when they build their sales process, they go, we built this product. So let's build this PowerPoint slide and this website and tell as many people about it as possible. It sets us up on the wrong foot. Instead, we have to work from the buyer in. We've got to understand our buyers, understand their goals, decide if we can help them, and explain that help in a way that resonates with them. This is so bad that we have words for these. Show up and throw up. And alligator selling with just big mouth, little ears. It's just so bad in sales, and now it needs to change. In fact, there's some great data out there. There's a great company out of San Francisco called Gone.io that is basically records your sales calls and has artificial intelligence that listens to the performance of those sales calls. This is a very simple analysis that was done on 500,000 sales calls across 20,000 companies. And all it showed was when is the salesperson talking and when is the customer talking and how much. And for the top performers, they spoke less than half the time on the first call. And on the bottom performers, they spoke most of the time. So statistically, this stuff is happening. And so when I saw that, from an onboarding and training perspective, I found it really important to try to get my sellers to walk in the shoes of our customers. Most of our training was not about the product. It was not about the sales process. It was about understanding the buyer. And so all of our salespeople in training built their own personal blog, built their own personal website on an idea or passion that they had. They ran email campaigns. They wrote blogs and ranked in Google. They set up a social media account to promote the idea. They converted the traffic with landing pages and they analyzed it. They became marketers because that's who we were selling to. And by the time they got on the phone with their first prospect, they could empathize and get into their shoes much better. Okay? The other piece we use is a buyer journey framework in order to figure out where a buyer is in their journey. Let's start there. You know, what do they think about at the awareness stage? What do they think about in terms of options to solve it? What specific vendors do they use and how do they measure success? Here's a company called Tiny Pulse, full disclosure I'm on the board of, but they, um, what they do is they have a very simple app that sends a note out to your company once a week and says, are you happy on a scale of one to 10? And it allows you to quantify the happiness of your team. And so this is the buying journey that we set up for them. And now this is the number one first objective of the sellers is to ask questions to figure out where the buyer is on their journey. What is their perspective and how do we sell them or do we even sell them based on that perspective? Okay. Now the other piece is the onboarding process. So I interviewed a number of heads of sales when I took the job. And I was amazed that most of the time when they trained their people, they really just sat the individual next to another top performer and said, that's your training. And that's a very dangerous approach in my, in my opinion. So I had two sellers. One was named Jen and one was Adam, both top performers. Jen was amazing at rapport building, amazing. She was above average on everything else but amazing at rapport building. When she called up her prospects, they talked about church and dogs and the kids and sports and the weather. That was most of the conversation and everybody bought from her because they loved her. Now Adam, he was amazing at activity. He made 40% more calls than anyone else on the team. Every time I stop by his desk, he's on the phone, he's got four tabs open, in our CRM, he's taking notes, he just cranked the activity. He was mediocre at everything else, but he had so much activity, big numbers fell down the bottom. Imagine if Adam trained Jen, or Jen trained Adam. 
They would have fallen apart. They would have had a different perspective of what success looked like at the company. They would have never leaned into their strengths. And by the way, salespeople are typically not good coaches. And so there's a huge problem I felt with this ride-along approach to training. So in similar to the hiring, I, I documented the blueprint of the skills that I wanted people to get out of the training, and I said, what a, you know, we certified. I had my trainer certify every candidate against those skills after training. And we basically went out and looked. Once we had these assessments, we could ask ourselves, 30 days into a candidate, is our hiring process falling apart because our scores are dropping? So it's usually hard to know that your hiring is not doing well until many, many months later. Six months later, when you finally see whether a salesperson's doing well or not. But if we were able to correlate the exam score out of training with ultimate success, we could get a really early sign as to whether hiring is getting better or worse. And by the way, I really question whether training is any good if it doesn't predict success. We've had 30 days with someone. If someone scores really high on training and then doesn't succeed, what are we learning? And if someone scores really low and they end up doing great, is training really that effective? So this is an opportunity for us to hold trainers accountable to a process and also to get an early sign on whether hiring is working or not. Okay? And again, applicable, this is how we did at HubSpot, is we had a number of different roles, sales, marketing, product, customer support, customer success, and a number of different training modules. And so everybody got the buyer training. We love that. Everybody got the sales process training, but just the salespeople got the advanced version. It was important that product knew a little bit about how we sold. And everybody got the customer onboarding process. Of course, we had technical architecture. We didn't have to tell the sales team how to do that, just the sales engineers and product. So it helped us to modularize this and scale it as we started scaling all these groups rapidly. Okay, let's talk about coaching management. So most sales managers that I see, in my opinion, spend too much time doing the job for the salesperson and managing the forecast. In my opinion, the sales manager job is about two things, hiring and coaching. If they can do those two things, they will be a great manager. And so the question is, well, what makes a great coach? And I'll give you an analogy with golf, a game that I've attempted to learn for about 15 years of my life. I've taken a lot of lessons. And one golf pro said to me, okay, Mark, let me see your swing. And I showed it to him. He's like, here's what I want you to do. Turn your grip over. Lean back in your stance. Put more weight on your right foot, not your left foot. Think one o'clock, not two o'clock on your backswing. And use more wrist on contact. I was like, are you kidding me? Where do I start with this? A different golf pro said, Mark, okay, take a swing. And I did. He's like, try this grip. Take 100 swings with that grip. So I did. 20 minutes later, he said, how does that feel? I said, you know, that feels pretty good. All right, now think about leaning back in your stance more. Take another 100 swings. It's such a simple example, but I, at HubSpot, promoted 20 salespeople to management and I watched them get their new hires out of training, and I watched them see that hire, new hire perform and see the 90 things that are broken with them, and they threw up on them with feedback for like an hour and a half, and it just confused the salesperson. The best managers, the best coaches saw the 90 things, but they could identify the one that was gonna make the biggest improvement right now and they use the data to diagnose that. And I call that data-driven sales coaching. Using the data to figure out what is the biggest skill that if they improved, it would make the biggest difference on their, their success. 
and honing in the coaching on that strategy. So gosh, it's almost after six o'clock and look at, we're looking at data here. So this was a funnel where each color was a different salesperson on a team. How many leads did they create? How many leads did they call? How many turned into demos and how much turned into customers? And what's the conversion rate between each? So what's broken with the person in purple up top? If we didn't have the data, every sales manager would say, they need to make more calls. Not here. They're making tons of calls. They just stink at getting those calls into demos. That's what's broken. And can we learn more from the data? They're the worst on the team at getting leads into demos. We can learn more from data. Is it that they call them, but no one returns their call? Or is it that they get them on the phone, but everybody hands up on them? My coaching would be really different depending on that outcome. And so it's an example of how we use the data in order to understand this. Easy when I had an eight-person team, harder when I had a 500-person team. And so when we grew, what I did was on the second day of every month, I met with my directors who had four sales managers and 40 salespeople under them. And I asked them, let's go through every single one of your salespeople and tell me three things. What are you coaching them on? Why? And how are you going to measure success of that coaching? And because I had that meeting, all the directors met with their managers that morning to go through the same information. And the day before, all the managers met with those salespeople to have that discussion. And so out of that meeting came a, a very easy analysis of the rep, our skill diagnosis, our coaching plan, and how we know it's working, how we're going to measure success. And now I had a nice little accountability of making sure coaching was being done proactively in our company. And I had a nice little paper trail that I could hold my coaches and my managers to. You know, John, you hired Bob three months ago. You loved Bob in the interview process. And you've been working on sense of urgency development with Bob all the way back to June, July, August. You're still working on it with him. What is going on? Did you make a bad hire? Or do you not know how to coach? Because you are controlling your own destiny. And this created accountability and a nice blueprint for my coaches and managers to run. Here's an example of a company down south in the United States that's done really well in fleet management for trucks. They sell huge deals, million dollar US deals, and they still apply this coaching model just in a different way. That was their Joe, their sales ops person, who was really fed up with the lack of accuracy of their forecast. And so he went out and set up this data to analyze each stages of the sales process. Now what's different in a big company environment with big deals is it's not about calls, like making 10 calls a day, 20 calls, 50 calls a day. It's about how fast the deals progress through these stages. So the point is that this data analysis doesn't just apply to companies that sell small products over the phone. It can be applied to any ticket size. And it can be applied to any role. This is really just about understanding a leading indicator to what success might look like. And in marketing, it's about quality content and engagement. In product, it's about any sort of weekly active usage growth that they might have. It could be time on call, calls per day. This can be applied to other roles to really be managing your business in a proactive way. Okay? All right, so let's. This is the process of the last step of allowing us to get, not just like do they get promoted or exit, is our hiring good, but what was the assessment? And that gives us a sense of whether our hire was good and our training was actually correlated. Okay? So let's finish up with the promote and exit. Okay. I'm really going to challenge here the 3% annual raise. You know, hey, good job. You've been at the company a year. 
here's your annual review, here's your raise. Especially in sales, where the outcome is very quantitative, why do we do it based on tenure? And so I broke away with that in the way we thought about promoting our salespeople. Instead, I said, okay, you join the company, you're a sales associate. I'm gonna pay you $40,000 base, $40,000 commission, depending on your sales, and I'm gonna give you $5,000 of stock, 5,000 stock options in the company. Okay. Now, how do you get promoted? It's not after a year. You get promoted when these things are done. When you sell $60,000 of monthly billings, which is probably gonna take about a year. When your average is greater than 5,000 a month for the last three months, and when you get, are getting a lot of upfront comp payments, that's when you get promoted. Some people got this done in seven months. Some people it took 20 months, but it was crystal clear on how you got promoted. And when you did, we'll pay you more variable and you give you more stock options, and here's your new set of goals. And the quote is higher, but they're getting more money. So while the average sales team retained their salespeople for 2.2 years in Boston, I retained my salespeople for seven years. Because as they moved up this ladder, they were just really successful, they were very predictable, they didn't take a lot of coaching, they were worth a lot to us, and we had a system to pay them more. And when they got calls from other companies, we were paying them above market because they deserved it. And they were happy with the next goal that they go after, especially for the millennial worker who's used to this high measure achievement, this worked really well for us, okay? Now on the other side, on performance plans, Firing people is tricky, and I, I'll be honest, I don't know the firing laws intensely here in Brazil. But in the United States, we just have to show a little bit of proof of a warning that you're underperforming, and then we can actually fire people. Most companies I work with, it's just too subjective. It's just, yeah, John's fired. And yeah, there might be some, you know, reasons for it, but the company interprets it as political. The company interprets it as their manager just didn't like John. And so what we did, again, sales, success, and failure is highly quantifiable. Why would you f make it subjective? So our performance plan on the second day of every new hire's time with the company, we told them what the performance plan was. It wasn't a big deal. We told them a bunch of stuff, and one of them was, this is how you get fired at the company. After seven months, if your average falls below 80%, you go on a performance plan. And you have two months to get above 80%, otherwise you're fired. It's cut and dry. And so when this happened, this wasn't the manager against the salesperson. This was the manager and the salesperson teaming up to win this plan. I'm sorry that you're on a plan. I will stay nights and weekends to get you off this, to coach you through it. We are here to support you. It wasn't interpreted as a political item, and it allowed us to keep that culture, and there wasn't fear. I'm so surprised how many salespeople are like, I just never know when I'm gonna walk into the company and get fired. It's not gonna happen. That would never be a surprise. You're all, you know how the performance plans works. And the final piece on the promotion is we set up a promotion process to management. So, so many companies I see is like, hey, we've got the sales manager role up. We're going to look at three people internally. They go through some interviews, and they promote one of them. The other two people are pissed, and they leave. And that's a shame that you lost that talent. So instead, we set up a process of certifying people with their skills, putting them through a 12-week leadership curriculum, and then allowing them to hire one rep while they still kept their quota just for a few months. And then we promoted them. And what that allowed us to do is when someone was upset that they didn't get promoted next, it was very clear where they were in the process. And we had a nice pipeline of people that we were developing over a six month period to get to those leadership roles. This is the, some of the subject material that we used. I put this together 10 years ago, so some of the, the readings themselves are outdated. 
but I put it there just to give you a sense of the skills we're developing, things like giving feedback effectively and handling conflict. Okay? So I will post these slides through Marcel. These are all, uh, all for you. And that really wraps up the framework that we have in terms of data-driven management. I hope it triggered a couple ideas. I'll leave you with this last comment, which is, you know, thank you, Marcel, for, um, for, for talking about the book. Um, the book has done amazingly well. I'm, I'm blessed and honored in it. I give 100% of the proceeds to this amazing nonprofit back in the United States that introduces entrepreneurship to kids in, in, to kids in high schools that are in really rough neighborhoods. Most of these kids do not graduate from high school, but the program introduces them to entrepreneurship, a great topic for me, early in their high school endeavor, and 99% of those kids end up graduating from high school and 85% go to college. The organization is called build.org. So just so you know, thank you for the support on the book and thank you for the support on that organization. Appreciate it.